Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or HFRF is a serious condition and it can be worse than cancer. In the last 30 years, we developed amazing medications that could dramatically improve lives and prevent suffering. But there is a hidden challenge here, low blood pressure. It's a common problem in these patients and sadly, it often leads to doctors holding back on these crucial medications. Today, we're diving into how to overcome this hurdle and how to optimize heart failure care even in the presence of low blood pressure. Welcome to Cardio Buzz. Join us if you want to stay up to date on the latest advances in cardiology. Cardio Buzz sifts through the studies, literature, and gives you the key takeaways for tough cases, all supported by scientific evidence and expert opinions. The European Society of Cardiology has recently released a statement on this topic. I will add the link to the publication in the description. Using this document and my clinical experience, we'll try to answer these questions. What's the definition of hypotension? How common is it in heart failure? What are the causes and how to manage? That's great. Let's first start by how common is hypotension with heart failure? The prevalence of low blood pressure in HFREF ranges from 4% to 40%. It's more common in acute heart failure than in chronic heart failure. And this wide variation in incidence is due to different blood pressure thresholds used in the studies to define hypotension. I thought the definition of hypotension is standard, isn't it? No, the definition is not standard. It's often arbitrary. Common definitions include a systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters mercury or a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters mercury at rest. The presence of orthostatic hypotension defined as drop in systolic blood pressure of more than 20 millimeters mercury or more than 10 millimeters mercury upon standing. Hypotension, which is blood pressure less than 90 to 100, associated with clinically relevant symptoms such as dizziness, syncope, headache, visual disturbances, nausea, or fatigue. These are all common definitions of hypotension. But a low blood pressure will probably mean a worse prognosis, right? Low blood pressure is an important prognostic marker in patients with heart failure. The risk of death or hospitalization rises 2.5 folds with a systolic blood pressure less than 80, and 1.5 folds with a systolic blood pressure less than 100, compared to a systolic blood pressure of 120 millimeters mercury. Hypotension is particularly dangerous in patients with severe peripheral arterial disease, carotid stenosis, mesenteric ischemia, end-stage renal disease, and autonomic dysfunction. But on the other hand, when patients are on guideline-directed medical therapy, this prognostic impact of hypotension is diminished. Major clinical trials have shown us that medical therapies have huge benefits even with low baseline blood pressure. But still, we have to admit that useful heart failure medications, ARNI, beta blockers, MRE, and SGLT2 inhibitors can all cause hypotension. Then, among heart failure medications, which ones have prominent blood pressure lowering effects? The worst is sacubitril valsartan, then beta blockers, whereas SGLT2 inhibitors and MRAs have the least blood pressure effects. Remember, the hypotensive effects diminish as the baseline systolic blood pressure becomes lower. We've seen that with SGLT2 inhibitors and in beta blocker trials. Also, the blood pressure tends to increase as the ejection fraction improves with treatment, as we saw with the trials on Eplerinone, Arni, Nalapril, and Varisigwine. Also, Evaberdine can increase the blood pressure. And of course, Digoxin is blood pressure neutral. Therefore, drugs can lower blood pressure or can improve blood pressure, and they are not always the real cause of hypotension in heart failure. Then, what are the most common causes of low blood pressure in heart failure? Hypotension in heart failure could be cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular. Non-cardiovascular factors like hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, hypoglycemia, sepsis, allergic reactions, vitamin B12 deficiency, anemia, iron deficiency, liver cirrhosis, dementia, and could be due to multiple medications. Some of them are non-cardiac medications and sometimes cardiac medications. The cardiovascular related causes could be the heart failure itself, dehydration, valvular disease, bradycardia, AV block, prolonged bed rest results in deconditioning and orthostatic hypotension. And of course, there are other cardiac medications that also lower the blood pressure. Well, there are many causes. But practically speaking, what should we do for a heart failure patient who is hypotensive? There are seven practical steps. Number one, determine if the patient is really hypotensive. Number two, determine if the patient is shocked or not. 
Number three, check if the hypotension is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Number four, correct non-cardiac causes of hypotension. Number five, try to get rid of non-heart failure medications that can cause hypotension or heart failure non-prognostic medications. Number six, think of general measures and specific heart failure treatments that can increase the blood pressure. Number seven, and that's the last step, is to down titrate the guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure. Why was the reduction of guideline-directed medical therapy the final step taken, despite being simpler and easier than the other steps? Because real-world evidence suggests that discontinuing or failing to restart the four heart failure therapies can significantly increase mortality. We tend to feel safer when we stop these medications that lower the blood pressure, but actually this worsens prognosis. And the poor outcome associated with the side effects of heart failure medications are more due to discontinuing the therapy rather than the side effects themselves. That's why we try hard to reintroduce treatment as soon as possible after we solve the blood pressure issues. Then, let's take the steps one by one. What do you mean by determining if the patient is really hypotensive? Measuring blood pressure, although it looks simple, is rarely done properly in everyday practice. And add to that the arbitrary definitions of hypotension. They both dictate that we need to be sure that the patient is really hypotensive before we take any action. We need a thorough understanding of the patient's clinical condition in total, not just the number of the blood pressure. We need to take the office blood pressure measurement in supine and in standing position to determine if the patient has orthostatic hypotension. And if symptoms occur with orthostatic hypotension, we consider that symptomatic hypotension. If we are not sure, then we can consider an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. And if symptoms correlate with a low blood pressure reading on the ambulatory blood pressure monitor, this is considered symptomatic hypotension. And we can reassess, of course, if we are in doubt. Okay, if the patient is really hypotensive, what's next? If the patient is really hypotensive, we need to decide if he's in shock or not. Shock is characterized by organ hypoperfusion, disturbed consciousness, cold extremities, oliguria, and acidosis. If any of these is present, the patient is shocked, he has to be admitted to the ICU, or better to an advanced heart failure service for vasopressors or other advanced therapies. And of course, we will hold any potentially hypotensive medications without hesitation. Great. If he is not in a shock state, but really hypotensive, as the numbers indicate, what's next? If the patient is really hypotensive and he's not in shock, then we need to decide if he's symptomatic from that number or not. Blood pressure is not always a good direct indicator of cardiac function and organ perfusion, and the decision-making should not be only influenced by low blood pressure readings, unless they are really critical. Systolic blood pressure less than 80. If the patient is asymptomatic or has mild symptoms, like mild dizziness or headache, with systolic blood pressure in the 80s or the 90s, then we usually accept the number. Then, what to do if the patient is hypotensive and has significant symptoms? If the patient is really hypotensive and has significant symptoms, then we need to correct non-cardiac causes, diarrhea, dehydration, sepsis, hypothyroidism, vitamin deficiency, the causes that we have just mentioned. Also consider getting rid of non-cardiac medications that have no prognostic benefit. For example, alpha blockers for prostate, phosphodiesterase inhibitors for erectile dysfunction, psychiatric medications, and even intraocular beta blockers. Even cardiac medications for symptom relief such as nitrates or antihypertensives like calcium antagonists or centrally acting agents, or even non-class 1 heart failure medications like hydralazine, all of these can be omitted. Try to distribute the medications along the day rather than taking them in one shot. We also strongly consider reducing the dose of diuretics, if the patient is not clinically congested, of course, and this can be guided by symptoms, signs, or by natriuretic peptide. We always try to keep the patient on the smallest needed diuretic dose. Got it. You intend to eliminate the agents that lower blood pressure and don't save lives. But do we have therapies that can leverage the blood pressure and improve the outcomes? Yes, we try to get rid of therapies that do not save lives. And yes, we do have some measures in heart failure that can increase the blood pressure. In addition to the non-pharmacological approaches like elastic stocking, exercise, and physical training, which can correct autonomic dysfunction, some procedures and drugs can also help. A CRT in a patient with wide complex bundle branch block can raise the blood pressure by 5% 
through improving synchrony and contractility. Tavi in severe aortic stenosis can raise the systolic blood pressure by 10 to 15%. Mitral edge-to-edge -edge repair can also improve the cardiac output. Restoring sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation can improve the cardiac output. Ivabradine and digoxin have benefits in heart failure and they do not lower the blood pressure. I understand. Then how do we handle the four main guideline-directed medical therapies? ARNI, beta blockers, SGLT2 inhibitors, and MRAs when the blood pressure is low, despite all that we did? Well, there are four possible situations. Hypotension in chronic heart failure in a drug-naive patient. Hypotension in chronic heart failure in a patient who's already on treatment. Acute de novo heart failure with hypotension. Acute decompensated chronic heart failure with hypotension. Well... Let's start by a chronic heart failure patient who is hypotensive and needs to start treatment for the first time. If the patient has severe symptoms and a low blood pressure, and we haven't started anything yet, here this patient needs to be referred for advanced therapies. We're speaking of vasopressors, mechanical circulatory support, or transplantation. If the symptoms are mild, we can start guideline-directed medical therapy, but with fine-tuning. We start by the two blood pressure-friendly medications, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitors. They have the least hypotensive effects. After that, we can start initiating sacubitril valsartan in a miniature dose of 25 milligrams twice daily and or beta blockers. If ARNI is intolerable, we can think of ACE inhibitors or ARBs instead. For beta blockers, we prefer cardioselective agents as they are more gentle on the blood pressure. We can up titrate later on with a slow pace and probably one drug titration at a time. Okay, then what about a patient who is already on heart failure treatment but becomes hypotensive despite all the other corrective measures? Here we assess the severity of the symptoms. If there are no symptoms or there are mild symptoms, we maintain the same guideline-directed medication dose. If symptoms are bad and the patient is hypotensive despite all the corrective measures, then we have to de-escalate the guideline-directed medical therapy and we'll discuss how to do that in a minute. Okay. Then how about hypotension in acute heart failure that is not in shock and did not respond to the other corrective actions? Acute decompensated heart failure with hypotension but not in shock. That's challenging and complicated. Here diuretics are essential in the first 24 to 48 hours to manage congestion. Then we rely on our two friends, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the MRA. Then maybe after another 24 to 48 hours of stability, we can think of adding small doses of ARNI and or beta blockers in the same manner that we just described. Cardioselective beta blockers, slow titration, one drug at a time. In acute decompensation of chronic heart failure, we try as much as we can to maintain the guideline-directed medical therapy. If we have to, we can reduce the dose rather than omitting them completely. And how about down titration? You kept it to the very end how to do it, which drugs, for how long. You also mentioned something about reinitiation. Could you please elaborate on all these points? Yes, for down titration, we depend on four variables. Renal function, serum potassium, heart rate, and the presence of arrhythmia. But the real heroes here are SGLT2 inhibitors. They need to stay on chart unless the patient is in shock. And then we think of which agents to down titrate or to reduce. If the EGFR is less than 30, then definitely we reduce RAS inhibitors and MRA. If the patient has hyperkalemia, again, we reduce RAS inhibitors and MRAs. If the heart rate is less than 60, then we need to reduce evabradine, beta blockers, consider pacing, and try to keep RAS inhibitors and MRAs. If there are severe arrhythmias, we give priority to beta blockers, and we can decrease RAS inhibitors and MRAs. If the heart rate is more than 70, again, we give priority to beta blockers, and we can reduce MRA and RAS inhibitors. If there's no specific clinical profile, then we try to reduce the two agents that have the strongest effect on blood pressure. These are RAS inhibitors or beta blockers. Of course, always think of replacing carvedilol by a cardioselective beta blocker. If ARNI is not tolerated, then think of a low-dose ACE inhibitor like enalapril or an angiotensin receptor blocker. Once the blood pressure improves, then we try to reinitiate these medications. Again, we start by SGLT2 inhibitor. It's the most friendly medication. Then we think of two variables, EGFR and heart rate. EGFR less than 30 will give preference to beta blockers, especially if the heart rate is more than 50 or more than 60. If the EGFR is more than 30, we look at the heart rate. 
a heart rate that's less than 60, then we give the priority to MRA, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs, and then we add a beta blocker if the heart rate is more than 50. If the heart rate is more than 60, DHFR is fine, then we initiate MRA, we uptitrate or restart the beta blockers, and later stage we think of the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or ARNI. Thanks, doctor. You made it clear. Could we please recap the main points of management of heart failure with low blood pressure? Yes, 10 points in a nutshell. Number one, try your best to keep guideline-directed medical therapy on the chart or the prescription. Assess symptoms in chronic heart failure and organ perfusion in acute heart failure. Symptoms make a difference and shock makes a huge difference. SGLT2 inhibitors and MRAs have the least effect on blood pressure. Give preference to selective beta blockers and to ACE inhibitors ARBs if sacubitril valsartan is not tolerated. Space medications in divided doses throughout the day. Think of blood pressure boosting drugs and devices, evabradine, digoxin, CRT, and edge-to-edge -edge mitral repair. Stop unnecessary medications and look for reversible non-cardiac causes. Down titrate or stop if the systolic blood pressure is less than 80 or the blood pressure is low with severe symptoms or hypoperfusion. Get rid of the least tolerated medications first and reintroduce the most tolerated medications first. And of course, consider referring to a specialized heart failure facility for further options if these symptoms persist. Thank you for watching. Tell us in the comments and share your experience on how do you handle low blood pressure in different heart failure patients. And if you like the content, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and share the content to spread the knowledge. See you all soon.